How's going guys, welcome to the channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto becomes the demon fox and got harem with Mocha. Part 3. If you wants to see awesome fanfiction like this, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get into the video. The white robe chairman, the undisputed leader within Yakai Academy and one of the three dark lords to have provided this well-made barrier against humans, sat quietly within his office. He contemplated at the state of his school and the potential revolution that he had hoped to have started. In the very beginning of the term, it seemed that everything had been going according to plan. The chairman had traveled into the human world, looking for a gullible easily manipulatable human with a easy and trusting heart. For him, the nicer and more naive, the better. He had come across Aono Tsukun by chance, and immediately noted his potential to being the perfect tool for his movement in the school. The human's overall profile was perfect for him. He had a naive outlook on life, lacked any real courage, and was mediocre at best in terms of intelligence. He was the perfect candidate for him to manipulate into the catalyst for change. But this in mind, he had purposely dropped a transcript next to his home and informed his friend that he would be ferrying a human into the Yakai realm. He even planned the time so that as he was walking through the path to school, he would encounter the vampire girl, daughter to the infamous Akashiya vampire lord. The chairman had been no stranger to the young Akashiya Mocha. After all, he had been the one to have procured the rosary, which held a capacity for Yaoki so much greater than her growth that it split her mind into two separate personalities. It was his intention to have a more human Mocha befriend and eventually fall in love with a human. Along the way, there would be plenty of individuals who would be jealous of Tsukun, and with his privilege to manipulate the rumors, many of the stronger delinquents would also see Tsukun as a growing threat. This was all in hopes that they would incur a self-fulfilling prophecy, that with these threats bounding through, Akashi Yamoka would be forced to inject her vampire blood into his veins. Then, Aono Tsukun would continue to grow under his supervision, becoming the first successful integration of a human into Yakai society. It was his hope to introduce more humans, making Yakai Academy the one place where Yakai and humans could go to school normally. It was his everything to have the Yakai then eventually reach into the human world and become accepted individuals. But out of nowhere, his plan was shattered right from the first day. He had been in the entrance of the forest that lead to the Akashi residence. He met the young vampire riding on her bike to school, and had even dropped a hint that she would be meeting a very significant individual, one who will be her most precious person. But that person was not Sukun. The arrival of this Yuzumaki Naruto had completely thrown his plan out in disarray. The blonde individual held no records to his past and was a total enigma. But he had arrived some time before the paths joined together to the school grounds. Some time after, the two of them had entered the campus without traveling into the larger path, completely destroying the first meeting with Tsukun that he had so hoped for. All of his plans centered into that first possible meeting, to establish a form of lust in the human that could blossom into devotion and maybe love. But Yuzumaki had completely grounded his plans into dust with his arrival, and the subsequent events after completely diverged from what he had intended. Instead of becoming the first successful human yakai hybrid with a normal mindset, Sukun became the plaything of the school succubus first year. Because of that, the qualities that had at first made Sukun such a complementary subject to his plans, instead turned him into a sniveling coward, too caught up in being a literal slave, than to worry about anything else. Not only that but Akashi Yamoka, who he had expected to never reach the level of his rosary for at least a few centuries, suddenly had an exponential growth in power, and her two separate personalities had once again mixed to one. It wouldn't be visible normally, but he had long placed a tracker on that silver cross, so that it would break the moment she reached the height of its capacity. He had intended for it to slowly wither in the prime of her life, not shatter instantaneously from two weeks into the first term. And he highly suspected that this Yuzumaki Naruto was the cause of it all. The blonde enigma did an amazing job in hiding his true form. Every single situation that had him and Mocha in danger never seemed to have revealed his true abilities. The only thing that he had revealed was that he was no human, that the amount of Yaoki he expelled was incredible, much too powerful for any normal student. In fact, the amount of power he expelled from that one occasion against Saizu rivaled his own, and he had a feeling that it wasn't even scratching the surface of it all. This Yuzumaki Naruto was dangerous. The chairman had no illusions in being able to control this one, that perhaps he could salvage his plans by instigating more meetings between Tsukun and Mocha, and have some way to stop either Kurumu or Naruto from appearing. There was no way that Mocha would ever leave Naruto willingly now and in the past two weeks, his discreet attempts to influence her thoughts were met with a resistance so fierce that he had to quickly pull back his strand of demonic magic, lest that entity would trace it back to him. Again, he suspected that Naruto was the cause of it all. Yuzumaki Naruto he narrowed his eyes at the magical mirror in front of him, where the reflected image was of in frontal view of the blonde enigma and Mocha walking to school together. Who are you now? What are you? 
Naruto hid a smirk when he felt that familiar presence again. Someone had been keeping an eye on him ever since the first few days in school. Judging by how it began happening only after rumors of his involvement against Saizu began circulating, he suspected that it was the chairman himself. After all, he would be the only one who would possess any interest at all over his role in it. The blonde sighed and stretched his arms, feeling content when his elbows popped. Having those extra hours to sleep really helped, especially when he was not much of a morning person at all. Naruto could easily wonder what would happen to some poor fool who decided to brag their problems on him if he never had enough sleep before to rein in his responses. Saizu, after he was beaten to a pulp by a weaker mocha, probably would have looked pretty damn good when compared to them. Of course, the immortal demon felt that a great deal of his contentment was through the successful control that he now had over that androgynous bis, Ishigami. With the art teacher now completely enthralled by powerful gain jutsu, flushing out Kai would be easy. As one of his informants, Ishigami could easily set loose that individual onto any target and judging from what he had learned, Kai was more of a attack first and ask questions never type of guy. That served his purpose quite well. Mocha, who had been walking side by side with her blonde lover, suddenly glanced back when she felt a familiar presence. Seeing the figure of a particular couple, her face hardened into a scowl, and she immediately latched her arms around Naruto's elbow, causing the blonde to glance down at her and arch an eyebrow. Don't look back. Her eyes, though still in their same radiant green, became slitted and cold. One of the stranger quirks to her two personalities returning to one again was that her eyes could change depending on her mood. They can be warm and human-like one second and then cold with suppressed demonic energy the next. Naruto had to say that the green slit eyes looked hot. And there is a reason for this because. Abyss and her wimpy toy are behind us. I don't want to have to deal with any drama this morning, especially since I just found out that someone was trying to probe my mind. Naruto grinned, seeing how his lover had finally began to grow into the massive power that she had received from him. Her senses were stronger now, even if they were dulled by her rosary, and she could tell that on more than one occasion, someone had been trying to reach into her mind with strands of demonic magic. Of course, the perpetrators were never successful as the blonde demon had made sure to strike back with force. But he was proud to see her growth as well. It made her a much more delectable mate than before. Mocha, you know that the succubus and her limp dildo wouldn't dare start anything since I'm here. I like to think that I did an amazing job of scaring the s out of them. Despite her disgruntled look just a few seconds ago, she giggled and smiled at his words. The young vampire looked up and met his gaze with genuine warmth in her eyes, something that took the blonde by surprise. How long has it been since those types of emotions were laid out naked before him? Naruto-sama. Are you alright? He blinked and shook his head to clear out his thoughts. Naruto grinned and nodded to her, filing the stray thoughts away so that he wouldn't be bothered by them. Since those two aren't threatening in the least, I think I'll go and poke fun at them. The blonde turned his head to the side and glanced behind him, where he could see the odd couple behind him. Kurumu was in front of Tsukun, pointedly ignoring the human sap. Instead, she was more into basking at the attention that many of the students were giving her as she walked by. Talk about attention whore. Tsukun, on the other hand, was trying to make himself as unnoticeable as possible, which normally would not have been a problem given his very generic features. But the idiot was also carrying Kurumu's school bag and walking behind her, and that garnered much of the students' attention as well. Naruto could clearly see the number of guys practically emanating an urge to pound Tsukun into an indescribable blob of flesh. It was amusing. One was practically glowing at the attention, and the other looked like it was killing him. Suddenly, both of them turned their eyes toward where he and Mocha were. Seeing how they were now the attention of their gazes, Naruto grinned and gently nudged his lover, who turned her head at his beckoning. Both of them were being glared at by one and stared at with lust from the other. Mocha shuddered when she caught how openly Tsukun was staring at her and immediately pressed her body more closely against Naruto's. She suddenly felt so violated. Naruto chuckled at how his lover suddenly pressed herself even more firmly against him, as if seeking shelter from some a very disgusting presence. Seeing her like that gave him an idea, and the blonde demon decided to have some fun with her little tormentor. He slowly removed his arm from her grasp and instead, wrapped it around her shoulder and pulled her even closer to him. Mocha blinked at the sudden display of affection and looked up at her lover in confusion. Naruto merely grinned at her before turning his gaze back to where Tsukun was walking. With a smirk, Naruto reached up and slowly pulled down his shades, revealing his blood-red eyes, slitted and feral. With his gaze locked with the humans, he sent a very concentrated and potent Kai straight towards him. In it, he poured just a fraction of his malice, cruelty, and intention to slaughter. The effect was instantaneous. Tsukun, who had been staring at Mocha with clear intentions, was forced to meet Naruto's eyes when he pulled her closer. 
The moment their gazes met, what felt like a wall of fear slammed into his body, so powerful that even his natural instincts to scream and run were drowned down from how helpless he felt. So the human did the only thing left possible in that situation. He lost control of his bladder. Ah. What the hell. Dude. This guy just pissed in his pants. You that's gross. One can only imagine what Kurumu thought right there as she stared at the boy collapsed in a puddle of his own piss. Naruto's shoulders shook with mirth as he and Mocha walked away from that scene. Oh he knew there was a reason why he had coaxed the human into staying here. A little cruelty a day was just what he needed to feel all giddy inside. Of course, he had to be sure not to completely humiliate Aono Tsukun on a daily basis. Who knows what type of mental breakdown that he could have if this much stress and humiliation built up. Naruto-sama. The blonde glanced down and saw Mocha looking up at him with a small smile on her face. Thank you for that. Um. I'm not sure I get what you're saying. Please. There's very few people who can do that without a single noise. Naruto grinned and admitted while he chuckled. It was fun. Um, are you sure about this information Ishigami? Oh definitely. The wounds that you see on me were all caused by Akashi Yamoka. I can personally testify to her abilities, but the other one, Yuzumaki Naruto he displayed nothing. In fact, the reports all say that he had no part in defeating any of those that encountered him. They were all done in by Akashiya. I see. That is indeed suspicious. But what about the eyewitness claims of him easily fending off the ogre first year? For all we know, Saizu-kun could have simply allowed the boy to attain victory in order to lower Akashiya's guard. He did try to rape her after all. Um, very well. I will follow this claim. If Yuzumaki is indeed a human, I will kill him and that traitor Akashiya. You've done your job well Ishigami. I'll be sure to request a higher payment in your salary. Though the pleasure was all mine Kaiyu-san. As the dark figure of Kaiyu disappeared, Ishigami slowly slipped back into her classroom and sat down to finish grading what little papers that were left. After the incident with Akashi Yamoka, word spread out that she was the perpetrator behind all the missing students. Ishigami almost lost her job but managed to retain it on a good track record. But still, she was strictly forbidden to do much and nearly all of her previous privileges were taken away by the chairman. Oddly enough, she didn't seem to care much about it. The only thing that had been in the art teacher's mind since her defeat was to report to Caillou about the vampire's companion. Her memory was strangely foggy about much of the events that happened, but what she knew with strong conviction was that the blonde Yuzumaki Naruto had been nothing but a spectator in her battle. After a little probing with what little favors that she still had, Ishigami found that all the encounters with Naruto ended in Mocha doing all the fighting. Of course, it excited the art teacher at the prospect of revenge. This arrogant blonde, who simply stood by and watched while she was humiliated, was probably nothing more than a weak little human. If that were true, then the scandal that will follow would make a child's play to enact her vengeance. Oh she can leave Yuzumaki to Kai. That one will have no problem torturing the blonde fool to death. No. Her desire to utterly desecrate Akashi will be all that much easier without a companion and reputation. Oh it's just too perfect. Ishigami actually shuddered from the thrill that she felt at that moment. The possibilities in which to humiliate that vampire seems almost endless now. I can't wait for it to happen. Neither can I. The startled art teacher snapped her head up in shock. Who's there? Show yourself. The voice broke off into a chuckle and in the farthest corner of the class, the shadows distorted as a figure began to walk up. As it got closer and closer, the darkness receded from its body, as if this being held total control over his surroundings. It was almost mesmerizing at how fluid that shadow looked as it slid off of this person's body. But all too suddenly, any trace of excitement turned to horror as a familiar mop of messy blonde hair became visible. Her fear only grew when all the features became visible, revealing the last person that she expected. Yuzumaki. Naruto grinned as he continued to walk forward. His eyes, without the shades, were closed, giving off the impression that he was blind. But Ishigami was not fooled, especially when the blonde purposely turned his head towards, as if he could see her underneath his eyelids. You had such a pleasant conversation with Kayu back there. It's just a shame that I didn't get a good look at his features. But no matter. Naruto opened his eyes and were she not rooted on the spot, she would have cried out. Those were not the eyes of a human. Glowing blue with power and an indescribably ominous presence. It was as if power and rage itself was warping itself into vision before her. I found out what I needed. And here I thought that pathetic kaitling would be a worthy opponent. HMPH just goes to show that I might be hoping too much for a school like this. Idling. This blonde first year would call Kayu in such a disrespectful tone. Just what is he? Ishigami furrowed her brows momentarily in confusion. Why did the term kaitling seem so familiar? She felt as if she had heard it before, used as a way of describing seniority. But what? Her eyes widened when the memory struck her. 
idling, like a fox. There was only one type of fox demon known. Do your A. Ah, ah, Anarito grinned and tutted his fingers playfully. But all too suddenly, her fear for the blonde rose to new heights. He was no human. He was probably the furthest away from humanity as possible. Ironically, she would have gawked at him if he had ever told her about his past. But that would never happen. You've outlived your usefulness, Ishigami. The blonde slowly brought his hands together in a ram seal, grinning all the way. And you've stumbled upon a very confidential piece of information that I don't feel comfortable sharing. I'm afraid that you're going to have to take a dive now. What are you going to? Hi. Suddenly, the art teacher arched her back and clutched her head in agony as the seal that was implanted within her brain began to distort itself. Her whole body began to spasm and lose control, with only a strange gurgling to emanate the torturous pain that had descended onto the gorgon. Her whole body was losing control with her limbs flying off in every direction and her body flopping on her seat uselessly. Finally, after a few minutes of waning spasms, Ishigami sat still, her mouth agape and her face set in a stupefied expression. It looked like she was frozen in time to anyone from the front, but from either side of her ears, mushy blobs of a pale substance began to leak out, dripping down onto her clothes. Naruto chuckled and began to walk out of the classroom, being sure to put on his shades in case anyone was nearby. As he walked out, the blonde took one last look at the unmoving art teacher and smirked. Brings a whole new meaning to the term brain dead. Naruto-sama, I think he's coming. He brought a few followers with him as well. Akashi Imoka narrowed her blood-red eyes as she knelt on top of the old warehouse-like building that they had picked for a confrontation. It was a far distance away from the school grounds and more importantly, from the chairman's eyes. Furthermore, Naruto had taken ample time to prepare this place in accordance with his designs. He still didn't want to reveal his powers to everyone, after all. The blonde, standing next to where Mocha was kneeling, reached up and took off his shades. With an annoyed sigh, he focused some energies into his eyes, placing a game jutsu so that they appeared human. Instead of the usual blood red, Naruto now had sky blue eyes much like before in his youth. The only difference now was that this was an illusion, made to hide his powers. Mocha glanced up and when she noted the change in his eyes, she furrowed her brows in confusion. If you could have done that any time you wished, would it not have been easier to morph your eyes instead of hiding behind your sunglasses? The blonde grinned and tapped the side of his head with a single finger. It may look easy, but I haven't been in the habit of using it for a while. It gets annoying if I have to maintain this illusion for a long period of time, so I usually just get the shades. Besides, girls think it adds to the sex appeal right? Mocha smiled and shook her head ruefully. Of course, even something like this would not faze her lover. Even though this Kaiyu, judging from the latent yaki that she could feel in this distance, was just as powerful, if not more so, than she was. Naruto still acted lightly, seemingly uncaring of the power making its way towards them at incredible speeds. Now then I suppose I have to put on that stupid persona. She watched curiously as Naruto huffed closed his eyes for a brief moment. There looked to be a sudden shift and when he snapped his eyes open, Mocha was stumped by what she saw. Her lover's eyes conveyed panic and desperation, as if he truly was still a human and had been found out by the student police. Naruto-sama. He turned his eyes towards her and in a split second, the veiled look returned. The blonde smirked and shrugged his shoulders. Like it. It's a mask that I've perfected since I was a brat. Full of emotion and kind of loud, but it serves to hide away my intentions. That was a mask. It truly looked so real. It was like staring at another person by how different his entire posture had been. The Naruto that she was used to carried himself with a distinct slouch, as if he were about to go to sleep any second. But there would always be this coiled up feel with him, as if he could strike out at a moment's notice. But the Naruto that she had just bore witness to was so full of emotion, his eyes clearly conveyed genuine panic and desperation, as any human would if they were caught with a horrendous crime. That was a mask. As if reading her mind, her lover smirked and looked up into the sky. What was that phrase that I picked up from all those idiots and feminists? Ah, yes. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, correct? He looked back down to her, and his smile became such a frightening display of coldness and immorality that she felt goosebumps well up just from that side alone. Well, a woman scorned has nothing over a scapegoat for fear and hatred. Before Mocha could make a comment on that, there was a gentle breeze, and suddenly, both Naruto and her were on the ground, within the warehouse. She looked up in surprise, and he merely shrugged his shoulders. Well they're going to be here soon so actors up. It's show time. He brought a hand up and slid it down his face. When the limb dropped, Naruto was back in that persona that so baffled her. And just in time as well. Well, well. I see you tried to escape after we found about you Yuzumaki. So this was Kai. The man was tall, though shorter than Naruto, and had long auburn hair. 
His henchmen looked fairly nondescript, but the yaki that was coming off of Kaiyu alone was enough to warn the young vampire. This person was not to be trifled with under normal circumstances. Keyword. Normal. Moka-chan, he found out. What the hell are we supposed to do now? Again, she had to stop herself from gawking at her lover and how different he managed to appear. Right now, Naruto was pressed against the wall and looked like was hastily trying to find a way out. Of course, there was no way out except for that one door, and the student police stood in its way. Calm down Naruto-san. Despite this, she had to maintain the act. Mocha narrowed her eyes and positioned herself in between her lover and Kai. It's alright, all I have to do is to defeat them, and you can escape then. Laughter erupted from where the pursuers were. With but a simple gesture from their leader, all of the followers charged forward, morphing into their respective monster forms. Soon, the young vampire found herself dodging from claws and spikes as the student police elites coordinated their attacks against her. It baffled her at how easily these beings were cornering her, despite the fact that she was easily tens of times stronger. So this was the ability of the student police, said to be able to bring down any who got in their way. Defeat us, eh? For a vampire, you sure aren't living up to your claim. Caillou gave a fierce grin when he saw one of his followers managing to nick at the corner of her skirt, causing a tear that revealed the edges of her panties. If you can't even defeat my followers, what use is there to have you fight me? However, the gloating stopped abruptly when Mocha spun her body in the air. All of a sudden, there was an extra bout of demonic energy that was not there before, and suddenly, three of his followers were on the ground, screaming and clutching at their dismembered limbs. The silver-headed vampire landed lightly on her feet and idly flicked some blood away from the end of her hair. I believe that your followers will be needing some medical attention soon. The remaining four backed up, their sudden easy victory seemingly not so easy anymore. But they remembered that backing off wasn't in their leader's tactics, and if there was anyone that they truly feared, it was Caillou himself. Immediately, the four resumed their attack. This time though, without the help from their three comrades, their attacks weren't as numerous and pressing. Mocha didn't even have to use her hair and simply swept her legs against each of them. One was sent crashing onto the ceiling from a knee to the chin. Another crashed onto the sidewall from a roundhouse kick. The third collapsed right there when she knocked his head into the ground. And the last was sent flying back to his leader from a powerful kick into the stomach. Before he could crash into his leader though, Caillou seemed to have lazily extended an arm and backhanded him right into a wall. I'm impressive. The head of the group smirked and suddenly, a ball of fire was hurled forward. Mocha's eyes widened and she just narrowly dodged it. A cry of surprise came up from behind her, and she looked back to see Naruto on the ground, staring at the fireball, as if he had never seen such a thing before. I suppose all that talk of vampires and their elite status amongst monsters have some merit. At the very least, you're above these simpletons who are too pathetic to even capture a measly human. But what can you do against someone like me? The air shifted and Mocha had to physically shield herself from a sudden strike. The attack was incredibly fast, and were she not at the strength she was now, her eyes would have never been able to have caught that split-second disappearance. Even so, the blow had enough force to send her crashing into a pile of rubble. Ahahaha. <laughs> What's this? Can't you even take on a weak kick like that? Mocha smashed through the debris that had fallen on top of her and immediately rushed forward to meet her foe. She twisted her body underneath him, gaining the strength ready for a powerful kick to his side. The young vampire gritted her teeth at the force exerted, but it paid off when the blow connected. There was a sickening crunch, and at least three ribs were fractured right there. Caillou lurched to the side and grasped his chest in pain. But Mocha didn't let up. She continued to press her advantage, sending blow after blow. The man managed to dodge quite a few, despite the injury that he received, but he couldn't dodge all of them, and she was rewarded with the feel of his body shuddering from the force of her blows. Mocha jumped back when she saw the Caillou was hunched over. The head police coughed and spat out a great deal of blood, showing that his insides were torn up as well. It was an easy victory after all and with this in mind, Mocha leaped up and spun her body to build up momentum. When she got close enough, her form halted the spinning to deliver a powerful blow right onto her enemy's forehead. This was victory. From where he was standing, Naruto mentally snorted within his mind. It seemed that Mocha still did not know the meaning of deception and fighting. It's to be expected. From what he had gathered, vampires thrive in war and slaughter, but all of it is done conventionally. There was no such thing as cloak and dagger for the warrior species so proud of their brute strength. Well. She'll be getting a crash course in that real soon. More like right away. The kick that should have ended the battle was caught in one hand. Mocha looked in shock when Caillou stopped his shuddering and sneered at her. Before she could do anything, he spun his body and hurled her to the wall next to Naruto. HMPH, pathetic. Kai wiped away the blood on his face, but winced when he tried to move. At the very least, that blow to the side was true. 
But the smile on his face never left, showing that he couldn't have cared less if his body was smashed to pieces. I will give you this, vampire. You are certainly as powerful as the stories say. But you don't even know when someone is playing tricks, what a fool. Moka-chan. Naruto ran over to where the young vampire laid and helped her up. He looked panicked and he began fidgeting with his hands, as if he didn't know what to do. Mocha slowly opened her eyes and flinched when she felt pain on her leg. Looking down, she noted that there was a deep burn mark where her enemy had grabbed her. It was incredibly painful and even with her vampire healing powers, it won't disappear for a while. I will have to show you then, the difference that makes me stronger. Caillou's smile turned vicious, and his entire body became engulfed in flames. The air heated up instantaneously, and a great deal of yaki descended onto the area. All too suddenly, the humanoid face not eaten up by the flames, began to distort and lengthen. The nose poked out farther and farther, and his ears began to move upwards as his hair disappeared into a mass of fur. Mocha stared at the beast before her. This wasn't just a fight between Yaokai. This was a battle between two of the arguably most powerful monsters in history. Mocha, the vampire and Kaiyu, the Yako. The flames slowly died away, leaving the spirit fox standing in the middle. Behind him, four fiery tails swayed wildly and quickly, blazing with a magnificent glow. With his transformation complete, Kai reared back his canine head and howled into the large warehouse. But this cry for battle, an eruption of Yaoki exploded from his position, colliding with Mocha and Naruto, as if it were a wall of wind. But just four tails he's this powerful. Mocha gritted her teeth and slowly got up to her feet. Her gaze flicked over to Naruto, who was looking at her, dissolved away into a mask of panic. Even if it were fake, she'd like to believe that her lover was truly feeling worried on her part. It would make her feel like she could take on the world if she were to find out her newfound love might not be as unrequited as she suspects. No, she shouldn't think about this now. The vampire shook her head and returned her attention to the spirit fox she had to push herself to the limit. That was what her lover had asked of her, and it was something she didn't intend to fail on. Listen Mocha. In the days to come, I have no doubt that Kai will seem incredibly weak compared to the enemies that'll show up. I may have given you a big boost in power, but it'll mean nothing if you don't know how to use it. This fight will be a crash course for you. Learn to work with your new powers efficiently. It won't matter if you win or lose. The outcome will be the same. All that you need to do is to grow used to the difference now compared to your past self. Naruto's words echoed in her mind, reminding her that she was to grow stronger, more in tune with her new powers, if she were to stay with him. Losing him now, after she had just found genuine and unconditional love for him, would be devastating to her. I can't stay weak, not now. Mocha slowly released her breath and calmed herself as she propped herself into a more ready stance. The silver-haired vampire then surprised her opponent when she slowly closed her eyes, diving her consciousness deep within herself. Behind her, Naruto felt satisfaction wound up within at the sight of her now putting an effort to look more closely within herself, to grasp the scope of her newfound strength. And it led to amazing discoveries. It seemed only like a second outside but within, Mocha closely held on to the strands of demonic power surging within her. Before, in her earlier fights, she fought recklessly and with full of openings in her attacks. It was her belief in her own strength along with the faster reflexes that came with her powers that allowed her to stay alive for so long. But not in this fight. Here, she'll have to put an effort to consciously seek out the limits of her abilities. She slowly relaxed herself and opened her eyes. As with before, when Kai let loose his blood-curdling howl, the parting of her eyelids was like the opening of a floodgate. With it came an ocean of Yaki, almost as strong as Kai's. It actually had the demonic fox staggering a bit from surprise. So it appears that you've been holding back as well, Akashia. Kai growled and hunched his body, while beating his tails together to build up heat. Impressive. A worthy opponent standing between me and my prey. He suddenly swung his body around, with his tails thrashing out towards where Mocha and Naruto stood. The vampire disappeared in a burst of speed, while Naruto did an amazing job of looking helpless and running for cover. It appeared that the four-tailed fox no longer had him as a top list any longer as his attention was focused unconditionally to the vampire. Mocha landed lightly on her feet, though there was still a slight limp from where her leg was burned. But she was forced to jump back again when suddenly, numerous balls of fire erupted from the demon fox and hurtled for her. She flipped back again and again until the wall was pressed against her, but when Caillou tried to hurl another blast of fireballs, she jumped up and used the ceiling like a spring. Suddenly, the vampire was right in front of him, and he had only his tails to defend himself. Caillou quickly backed up and Mocha followed. Her body twisted in unbelievable speeds and angles as she pummeled her opponent with blows. Each hit drove his tails away, leaving his body unprotected. This gave her many chances to press on, and with a ferocity befitting her ancestors, she did so. 
Her legs, sent into the air from the force of her blows, suddenly came crashing down onto the demon's head in crushing heel drops. The blows had enough force to cause an enormous crater to appear below them. But Mocha wasn't finished. She grabbed her opponent's neck and did a backflip. Both her legs crashed up onto Caillou's jaw, rocketing the demon fox up to the ceiling. Her opponent yelped when his back collided heavily with the wall, and he fell in a disorganized heap. Once again, Mocha saw fur to press her advantage. She immediately charged forward, intending to do an axe kick to his exposed neck. But as with before, Caillou had faked it. The fox snarled and sent his tails hurtling forward like missiles. He had every intention to skewer her body with his tails right there, but surprisingly, the vampire dodged all but one. Instead of moving out of the way from the fourth tail, she reached out and grabbed it. Suddenly, Caillou's entire body was lifted from the ground as Mocha cried out and swung him around like a top. Faster and faster, she spun herself. The silver-haired vampire poured so much demonic energy into her limbs that portions of her skin were forced open from the force of her muscles ripping. Yet still, she continued to pour more energy, believing her opponent to be at his limits. Finally, she released her grip and the demon fox exploded away from her, causing multiple sonic booms from the force of his departure. She had every reason to believe that she had won. Kai was defenseless to her attacks and his attempts at trickery were beaten back. He had nothing else to show and she had saw fit to defeat him then. She even poured so much energy that her limbs actually gave out. So it was a shocker for her when her opponent did not disappear. Oh, it looked painful for him, like a torturous procedure. But Kai was still there in the building. His body was suspended in midair, but he was held in place both by the momentum of Mocha's throw and his tails anchoring his body in place. Fishers emerged in the ground from the sheer power of the combined forces. And it looked like the demonic fox was putting every effort to stay in place. But the force of Mocha's throw began weakened and with it, her victory. It was not easy for him though. He landed onto his feet heavily, and his tails were all torn up from anchoring his body. It was only thanks to the blood blessed by Inari, the chief deity of foxes, that he even managed to heal himself so that he wouldn't cave in from inside out. But it was worth it. Ayu panted and wheezed, struggling to his feet just as Mocha collapsed to the ground. His breathing was labored, but he still had enough power inside him to fight. The demon fox slowly began to chuckle as steam poured out of his tails. When they began to wrap around his form, that chuckle turned into a full-blown laugh. The worthy opponent indeed. To think that you vampires are not simply all talk and can fight like that. It makes me wish that there were more of you in this school. I would relish another chance to utterly crush you filthy creatures. The steam erupted into flames, and with it, Caillou's form began to morph once again. Slowly, he began to appear more and more humanoid. Before the young vampire's limp form, Caillou the four-tailed fox took on his most powerful form. His lower body retained the fox form, and his four tails became fully healed. His upper body became entirely human with the markings of power that denoted him as a four-tailed fox. Above, nestled on his head, two fox ears popped up, completing his transformation. As the flames died down, he quietly took a step forward and flexed his fingers before turning his attention to the vampire, who still managed to retain consciousness. You put all of your power in that throw didn't you? He smiled and for a moment, he actually looked benevolent. It was a great effort and were it not for me anchoring myself, you would have definitely won. I had not expected anyone to have been able to pour that much energy into their limbs and still being able to function through it. But it all ends now. Kai raised his arms and began to gather a great deal of energy once again. The enormous amount of Yaoki began to condense and form itself into flames. His face widened into a victorious smile as the flames gathered together into one enormous fireball. This is my strongest attack, a stronger faster fox fire. There is no way for you to defend yourself from this. The victorious demon laughed and hurled his flaming orb. Burn you mongrel. Burn until not even your ashes remain. The orb exploded on contact with so much force that it actually caused the building to shudder. There was no movement coming from the large pillar of smoke, not like he was expecting any. It was over now. Akashi Yamoka was dead. Flushed with his victory over a good fight, the demon Kaiu licked at his fingers and prepared himself to enjoy his time ripping out the entrails of the human. Without that vampire to protect him, Yuzumaki was his for the taking. Already, he could feel the urge to drive his claws into his stomach, ripping his organs to shreds while listening to the beautiful melody of his screams and begs. Ha 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 ha. Were you fantasizing about ripping me to shreds Kai? The demon fox stilled and immediately looked back to the pillar of smoke. It slowly began to disperse, and with it, the hidden sight was revealed before him. The four-tailed fox felt his eyes widen in shock. Impossible. Akashiyamoka was not dead. She was standing, more like propped up by her savior's hand around her waist. Her body still had numerous cuts and blood pooling out. 
Her uniform was ripped to shreds due to the debris that exploded with his fox fire, and she looked ready to collapse any moment. But she was alive. Impossible. Oh, it's very possible Caillou. After all, I was the one to save her. He turned his attention the blonde, who was smirking at him, as if he held a tantalizing secret that was too great to not reveal. Seeing him there reminded the fox that he was supposed to be a human. How, then, could he appear there and hold her up after his strongest attack? It only came to one conclusion. The Shigami tricked me. Naruto reared back his head and laughed. It echoed in the large building and irritated the demon with this unknown joke. When the blonde returned his attention to him, he was giving out a vicious smile. Tricked you, yes. After all, she was my pawn to use however I pleased. But don't you think I put up a good ruse as well? I could see how easily you accepted me to be human after seeing my little act. Once you believed that I was human, you looked for any sign to confirm it, and I was all too eager to give it out. Ayu shook with white-hot anger only humiliation could give. His fists shook and his fingers dug so hard that blood came out from where he clenched them. All around, his tail's thrashing created a miniature firestorm to show how angry he became. You pathetic vermin dare trick me. Vermin eh? Neruo grinned and slowly dipped his head to moke his limp body. He opened his mouth and with an almost loving care, licked at the wounds on her cheek and chest. The vampire stirred to this ministration and shuddered from how amazing it felt on her tired and worn out body. The pain from before was immediately replaced by pleasure, and she could literally feel her body awakening, healing itself with the aid of this powerful force. She slowly opened her eyes, and when she saw a familiar sensation sliding along her body along with that messy blonde hair, she could only sigh in bliss. Naruto saw as she gasped when his tongue slid just over her breasts. The pleasure just kept coming. Though she was still tired from having expended so much energy, she felt warm spreading again to the areas that had cooled to startling levels. Naruto was healing her, keeping her alive with his powers. For Kaiu, another sight presented itself. Right before his eyes, Mocha's many wounds began to steam from where the blonde had licked her. To his shocked gaze, the steaming wounds began to heal and close up, much like how his own wounds healed themselves. But a level like this was mind-boggling. How in the world could they heal up in just a matter of seconds? And furthermore, did she just address him as master? If a vampire of that level would submit herself to this blonde, didn't that mean that he was even stronger than her? Uzumaki Naruto the blonde stopped his licking and released his hold to the vampire's waist. Without this crutch, she collapsed to her knees, but thankfully, she regained enough strength to fully awaken herself again. Though her body still ached, it at least managed to regain some of her awareness again. Seeing this brought a scowl on Kaiu's face as he addressed the enigmatic being before him. What are you? Naruto smirked and idly scratched his head. Oh. Didn't you call me a vermin? Since you seem so sure, I guess I can go with that. Don't fuck with me. The ground trembled and fire erupted from Kaiu's position. He howled and began summon torrents of flames all around him, mustering all the yaki that he possessed to crush this infuriating mongrel before him. Seeing this, the blonde sighed and held out his hands in a placating manner. Pine, since you're so inclined to know what I am, I guess I can show you. He turned his gaze down to his lover, who now looked up at him with wide, expecting eyes. Besides, my dear Mocha here is curious as well. I can't keep her in the dark forever. Very well then. Show your form and take this seriously. I will crush you like the bug that you are. Take this seriously. Naruto snorted and suddenly, his sky-blue eyes darkened. The illusion over it completely disappeared, revealing a strange pair of dark blue eyes with slitted pupils and four diagonal lines. Fool. Against you, I won't even have to lift a finger. Suddenly, the building began to appear different. Archaic symbols began appearing everywhere, and with this sudden appearance, Caillou had to show some level of unease. Just what was going on. Oh don't worry. I laid down this seal around the building early on just for this. I set this up so that I can release my powers without fear of anyone discovering it. Naruto grinned at how nervous the four-tailed demon fox looked now. That's right. Look on with helplessness you foolish kiteling. This is the form of a much greater being. His body began to morph, with flames flickering out all around him as well. Yaki, so thick that it felt like being drowned in an ocean, slammed into both of the onlookers, as Naruto's form slowly became wrapped up in a cocoon of crimson red fire. All around, the archaic symbols glowed and pulsed with the power that erupted from where Naruto was. I wanted to run. This was no simpleton that he could crush. The sheer volume of power easily dwarfed his own and was frankly, the largest amount that he had felt from a single being. Compared to both his and the vampires, it was like a pair of sand grains against a mountain. Oh, he wanted to run so bad. Fear true fear wounded in his heart and for the first time in 20 years, he wanted to rush back to the fox village and curl into the safety of his mother's presence. The energy that came out was not natural at all. Even by a demon's standard, this power bore too much malice, cruelty. 
The intention to kill was so overpowering that he could see the shadow forming behind the blonde. One cannot normally see a shadow of a person's killing intent. It was an impossible concept. Yet that concept was shattered as he could literally see an almost solid shadow forming behind the fire engulfed being before him. Nothing made him want to escape more than this. But he couldn't. The power compelled him, and it felt like his legs were petrified. He wanted to flee this, but his body was no longer his own to command. For Mocha, she was shuddering in fear and excitement. It was a fount of power that scared her so much that she too wanted to flee from it. But at the same time, her body reacted naturally with this power. It was familiar to her, having nurtured her growth with its strength. Her body simply would not abandon the vast ocean that had carried her this far. On a more instinct-driven level, she simply felt excited beyond belief. Her vampiric urges were practically singing to the safe havens at this power. A true mate, so incredible that it sated her impulse to find a suitable lover and saturated her body with this impulse to bow herself to his rule. This was true power. Foolish Kai. You dare battle with my lover and call her weak. The voice that came out was definitely Naruto's. But at the same time, it was different. Power and malice saturated every word, and yet, it came out light. At the same time, you dare call me a vermin. From within the fire, a still morphing appendage reached out and wrapped itself with a gentle care around Mocha. To Kaiu's dumbstruck gaze, it lifted her up and pulled her in just as the fire began to dissipate. Along with the waning fire, Naruto's true form revealed itself for the first time. And Kaiu suddenly felt all hope was lost. I am possible. Naruto was still wearing his uniform, but just about everything else about him became so different. His messy blonde hair became red like blood. The three small ponytails behind him had grown out into a single long flow of hair. His face looked very much the same, but his eyes, instead of blue, was now purple and flashing with fury. Finally, the features that shocked Mocha and horrified Kaiu beyond belief. The pair of canine ears on top of his messy red hair. And nine fluffy red tails flowing behind him, with one still wrapped around Mocha. It was too much for the four-tailed demon. Against this colossal being of power, he simply collapsed and stared at him with horrified disbelief. No it can't be. Foolish Kaidling. You dare called me a vermin and belittled my mate. The tail that was wrapped around Mocha pulled itself back, but instead, his hand reached out to wrap itself around her waist. Do you know who I am you pathetic whelp? Hey Kentucky. Speak. The shadow that had been forming behind Naruto finally finished forming, and the image that appeared would forever burn itself into the memory of the foolish four-tailed fox. Behind this colossal being of power, the image of a giant nine-tailed fox loomed over, fury and rage marring through its every feature. It was a sight of legend, of terror. It was something that he never thought he'd lived to see. Hey QB no Yauko. A normal day, a quiet day. That was what many in Yaokai Academy were expecting when they made their way to their classes. After all, what else was there to suspect? It was just another day in school. But when the first students made their way to their classes, gossip erupted and soon spread like wildfire. Everyone one looked, boys and girls were listening with wide, disbelieving eyes, as the speakers relayed a shocking announcement. Ishigami Hitomi, the art teacher who had just been a part of a huge scandal, was found dead in her classroom just this morning. And immediately after the find, the student police arrived in force to hush up all the details so that they wouldn't be spread out. Soon though, rumors began running around with possible scenarios of just what happened to have caused the art teacher's death in her own classroom. Many favored a simple conclusion of suicide. After all, she had just been in an enormous scandal involving her kidnapping students as far back as her early days in school. Suffering such a humiliating series of accusations after the evidence was revealed would no doubt have been capable of leading to her suicide. But then, others were quick to point out that the students who stumbled onto the scene had noted how the art teacher had been found with a series of papers and even with a pen in her hands for possibly grading it. Also, she possessed a stupefied expression along with some found smelling substance coming out of her ears. There was no conventional way to kill someone like that. That led to the more popular theory, murder. Someone could have quietly entered her room without her knowledge and struck her when she was in her most vulnerable state. This immediately set up an uproar through the entire school. The fact that the student police were so secretive about this particular case only added fuel to the flames as students panicked over a killer in the loose. It was ironic as most of them were monsters used to an almost warlike mentality simply from genetics. For class 3A, the subject was an especially juicy topic to discuss over. After all, their own Yuzumaki Naruto and Akashi Yamoka had been the ones to have flushed out the scandal. It was practically their right to gush out all the gossip that they need concerning the art teacher's sudden death. Suddenly, the back door to the classroom slid open, and everyone turned their attentions to the new arrivals. Most of their faces split up into grins. Boy Yuzumaki, Mokasan. You two heard about what happened to Ishigami. 
Uzumaki Naruto, the tall blonde with shades covering his eyes, snorted and jerked his head towards the hallway. Please, the whole school won't shut up about it. Everyone here gossips more than a bunch of old hags on knitting night or something. Hey hey, it's alright you know. Since we're the class with the two who flushed out the scandal, we should have free reign to spread rumors and stories. The male student who spoke up, a somewhat lanky individual with black straight hair that reaches below his chin, grinned and gestured for the whole class. So, any ideas as to what happened? I personally think that the bis just went and keeled over from humiliation. Mocha sighed and shrugged her shoulders. Who knows? I rather not think about her too much since she was targeting me. I'm just glad that Naruto saw Naruto kun was there to stop her before I became a statue too. She had jumbled up the words a bit, almost addressing her lover as she normally did. Though she herself had no problems with displaying her subservience to him, it would no doubt cause suspicion to rouse up in the class over just why she treated him with such respect. Thankfully, no one seemed to have caught the slip. It was when the two were making their way towards their seats that some of the classmates noticed something strange. Akashi Yamoka was wincing with every step that she took. It was barely noticeable as she was walking normally, if a bit slowly. But it still stood out, and since many of the students were in gossiping moods, they got curious very fast. Boy Mokasan. One of the students pointed at her legs. You fell or something. You're wincing like crazy. That had just about everyone now turning their attention to the pink-haired beauty, who was giving the loud mouth a withering glare. Once she was sure that the student was perfectly cowed by her displeased stare, Mocha quickly smiled and waved her hands in a dismissive gesture. Oh, it's nothing. I just tripped and fell on my leg when I was coming here, that's all. The young vampire was glad that most of the students in her class were easy to fool. She didn't want to have to go through more detail on an excuse made up on the fly. Mocha sighed when she took her seat and subconsciously rubbed her legs together. Oh she was sore alright, but it had nothing to do with her walk to the school. After her lover had completely crushed the student police force led by Caillou and forced them to a shameful retreat, he had saw fit to activate another type of seal before covering her body with his own. She didn't know what exactly had happened, but since no one showed up again after, Mocha could only guess that the seal had hid the entire building. With no one to scrutinize them, Naruto had saw fit to flex his true body with her. Having been enthralled by the sheer volume of his initial power and form, she hardly put up much of an argument as he discarded her shredded clothing and proceeded to rut with her all the way up to the next day. Though she was incredibly sore from accepting him while in his true form. But surprisingly, the only thing that ached were her more intimate areas. All the wounds that she had received from the demon fox Kaiyu had completely disappeared. Sometime during their night of passion, Naruto had completely healed all of her injuries. The hand on her shoulder suddenly jarred Mocha out of her musings. Surprised, she looked up to see her lover looking down at her with a raised eyebrow. It didn't take much to guess what he was thinking about as he was in a perfect position to see her absently rubbing her thighs together. The young vampire immediately looked back down with a faint blush on her cheeks. It didn't matter if he was her lover or not, getting caught in such an awkward position was awkward, at the risk of sounding redundant. Hey. Mocha nearly jumped from her seat when Naruto's voice whispered in her ear. She quickly cast a gaze around the entire room to see if anyone was watching. When she saw none, Mocha quickly turned around to fully see her lover smiling secretly, his shades lowered just enough for her to see his red slitted eyes. What say we go on a little trip after school? Trip? Where to? Though I have a place in mind, but we'll be needing dear little Kayukun to guide us. His smile, while appearing innocent, held a rather sadistic smile. Mocha almost felt sorry for the four-tailed spirit who looked like an inflated mass of flesh once Naruto was done with him. Of course, any sympathy was wiped off with a memory of how stronger he was compared to her, even with the power boost granted by her lover's blood. That didn't exactly make her happy. Is it absolutely necessary? Mocha pouted angrily at Naruto, annoyed that he was thinking of bringing that four-tailed fox. What if he and I start fighting as soon as we see each other? The blonde grinned. Maybe I'm hoping for that to happen. Your plan seems like madness to me. Then there's a method to it. He chuckled and straightened back, pushing his shades firmly into place once more. We'll be gone for a week at least. I've already arranged it so that no one will notice our disappearance. Naruto took his seat besides her just as Nekunam sensei walked in. Class immediately settled down, if only because the teacher hardly looked in the mood to tolerate any noise. It was clear that despite any scandal going about, Ishigami was still a member of the faculty, and her death would naturally affect the rest of the teachers. Naruto folded his hands in front of him to hide a rather vicious smirk. Ishigami's death was merely the bait. Now how big of a catch will he get? It was the worst possible outcome for the head of the student police. He had followed up on a terribly bad lead in regards to the blonde enigma and had paid for it dearly. 
Not only was he horrified beyond belief to have fought against the most powerful being of his own species, but the subsequent slander that followed after his humiliating defeat forced his iron rule to open up. His own subjects no longer feared him as much as before, and it showed in how they no longer tried to finish his orders as quickly as possible. It was a blow to his image, and a terrible one at that. Yet at the same time, Caillou found that he did not care so much for his ruined reputation as he normally did. Sure, it definitely irked him, but he was more intrigued with the arrival of the QB. The strongest demonic fox, hailed as a god even amongst humans, was always said to be the harbinger of great changes. From the scrolls written by the QB's progeny and then passed down through generations, the first time it appeared it brought on the golden age of monsters. But just as quickly as it appeared, their great progenitor vanished. Since then, various events culminated in humanity flourishing and the monster species being driven into a small corner. But once again, the great QB has returned. What does it mean for them? Despite having spent years building up his image in the school, Caillou was dedicated first and foremost to his own race. And despite having been thoroughly thrashed by the QB, simply having been in his presence was an honor none could claim. It was a distinct pride that made him think of his wounds as well deserved. Still, several things irked him. While there was no doubt that Uzumaki Naruto was far stronger than anyone he's ever known and could very well hold the boast of the QB, Caillou found himself wondering as to why the Fox Lord would choose a lowly vampire as a mate. Vampires had always been a warlike species that thrived in great bloodbaths. But even the purest and strongest of vampires would have difficulties against four-tailed foxes such as himself. And by the time a fox grows his or her fifth tail, then even considering vampires as a threat would be laughable, and only the strongest of vampire lords could prove as fitting opponents. So what was in this vampire girl that intrigued his lord? Surely, he could have picked one of the more powerful kitsune as a mate. Also, he had a great deal of fear for the colossal entity that all but killed him the day before. The wise matriarch of his village, possibly the only one old enough to have remembered a time with a great fox, had spoken of the QB no Yako as an entity that inspired Shira awe and entrancement with its presence. In fact, his matriarch has made it as if the QB was truly a divine being. I certainly felt no divine presence when against Naruto. Instead of awe and entrancement, the only things that had gone through Caillou's mind was absolute terror and helplessness. It was such a calm thought for him to know he was but a speck against this monster, and that there was nothing he could do to stave off the inevitable. Was this the very same being that the matriarch had talked about? Could this monstrous fox be the same divinity of the past? Oh, Kayukun, just who I was looking for. The head of the student police jumped and spun in his seat to where the voice came from. At that moment, he found himself face to face with that very same being that inspired terror to his very bones. Caillou hastily climbed off his seat, ignoring the way his body screamed in pain, and knelt down in subservience before Naruto. Hey Q, B Sama. Forgive me, I did not know that you were coming. Oh there's no need for that. In truth, I've come here to ask a favor of you. Anything. I'd like to go around and see how much has changed since the past. And at the same time, my maid has expressed an interest in finding more about the race possible of besting her. Caillou snapped his head up in surprise, and saw Naruto's deceptively cheerful smile. I'm asking you to be our guide. Take us to the Kitsune village. I have business to attend there. Mikagami, the headmaster of Yakai Academy, narrowed his eyes at the crystal orb in front of him. It was infuriating at how well the blonde was at hiding his abilities. Their unofficial battle of wits had consistently turned out in his favor, no matter what obstacle placed in his path. What's more, there were moments where the blonde would purposely look in the direction of his side and smile, declaring quite openly that he was well aware of the headmaster's attempts engaging his strength. After he had caught wind of Caillou's movement in this, the headmaster had hoped that some movement would happen. The four-tailed fox demon was stronger than the vampire girl, even with her sudden increase in strength, and would no doubt force the blonde to reveal his hand. Caillou had even brought a couple of relatively strong henchmen to put a harsher strain to the couple. But again, it seemed that Yuzumaki had been expecting it. Not only did the fight occur in a place that was near the very edges of his sight, but upon entering, there was a disturbing silence that had blanketed the battlefield. He tried to channel his powers in order to see more, but to his horror, Mikagami had discovered intricate seals warding off his probes. They not only prevented him from knowing what was going on inside, but it also lashed back at his yaki. He was caught completely by surprise, and found that a portion of his demonic energy was literally oaten by the defending wards. He was forced to wait out the battle, but with Yuzumaki's display of skills and seals, he knew what the outcome would be. Hai was defeated. No, defeated was too good of a word. The head police and his underlings were utterly routed in the fight. He couldn't tell much either than the fact that Caillou looked like a bloody mess when he was thrown out of the building. Again, Naruto had looked in his direction and smiled before walking past his line of sight. 
He did notice that Mocha appeared to have been injured and unconscious, though her wounds were nothing compared to the fox demon. Mikugami had tried to question Kaiyu on what happened the moment he regained consciousness, but to his surprise, Kaiyu was not only silent to all questions, but had even somehow threw him out when he tried to read his mind. Once again, Yuzumaki had covered his tracks well. And now, something else has happened. He couldn't tell what and after a cursory glance, could see that both Yuzumaki and Akashi were in their classrooms. But something was different in the air, as if a spell of some sort was used without his knowledge. Seeing the blonde smile at the vampire girl, the headmaster could not help but think that this was once again something that Yuzumaki had done. The only question now was what did he do? The headmaster tapped his fingers for a brief moment, contemplating on his choices. Really, there was a multitude of options available, but he was not fond with most of them, that involved the organization he worked for. But which were the greater evils? While he worked for that organization, he certainly wasn't accepted in it for obvious reasons. The Dark Lord would have been incredibly offended with this were it not for the fact that many of the leaders within the organization could kill him with ease. He disliked them but at the same time, he gathered his powers from them. Without that group, he would have been nothing and all those monsters old enough to remember certainly knew this. But then there was Yuzumaki, a thorn in his side that had completely ruined his plans. At the same time, he was an unknown factor with enough power to defeat the most zealous of individuals. There is even a chance that he might usurp his position and take on the mantle of a Dark Lord. While the notion was not likely, it wasn't impossible either. Mikagami had enough knowledge to bet that the mysterious blonde could easily defeat him in a battle. So who should he place his hopes on? After a moment of consideration, he stood up from his seat and walked over to a nearby cabinet. Mikagami slowly opened the doors and picked up a modern-looking cell phone. It was of sleek design and completely black, except for a silver cross embedded on the back. The headmaster stared at the device for a few moments before finally pressing the speed dial. He then casually pressed the speaker and took his seat, awaiting the inevitable answer. What do you want Dark Lord? I have need of your assistance once again. Something has come up in my little institution. Abrupt laughter came out from the other side, annoying the Dark Lord. What was so damn funny? I'm serious. Oh we know. Do not take us for fools impure one. The voice came out arrogantly, further annoying the headmaster. But make no mistake, we are under no obligations to help you. We put you in power for the sole purpose of our entertainment. If this individual would like to take that power away, then we will merely sit back and watch. Fools. What if he's too strong for you? There are no monsters stronger than us. There has only been one individual to give us pause, and we dealt with that centuries ago. Do not think for a moment that a being as strong as that is capable of emerging without our knowledge. The line went dead, giving him the unwanted answer he feared. The organization was not going to come to his aid. They were willing to watch quietly as he is defeated and in the most likely scenario, killed. Somehow, the Dark Lord knew that the blonde was plotting something against him. Somehow, he just knew that if he did not get some type of aid, then he was likely doomed. Mikagami growled and ripped the silver cross on his neck. Beads spill out from the torn string and collapsed to the floor as he reared his hands and threw the item against the wall. What was going to happen? What in the world was he to do? The sky was clear in Higashiyama-ku. Of the eleven wards of Kyoto, this sleepy little district houses the smallest population, as well as being mostly of elderly people. Because it was so small, practically everyone knew one another in something along the lines of a large family. Therefore, it was easy for the many working the stalls and stores in the area to immediately notice the group of three that stood out amongst the rest. The one leading the group was a man dressed in in a long black coat over a dark blue dress shirt. His pants seemed of the standard business attire, and every local there could immediately see the polish on his black leather shoes. He had long white hair that reached to just below his shoulders, along with a seemingly refined face. That, along with the way he walked gave him the appearance of somewhat of a regal appearance. Dust by sight alone, many of the locals found themselves disliking the man. He looked too much like one of those corporate people that had once expressed interest with turning their beloved land into some type of metropolitan junkyard. The two behind him, though, appeared to be exact opposites of each another. The first one they saw was a tall male, dressed in a black form-fitting shirt with a cartoonish skull sporting a crescent mustache and a pair of baggy jeans. On his feet were wide thick shoes that some of them wondering as to the design. They were of the same design as the normal tennis shoes most people wear, but were much too wide. At the same time, they barely went above his ankles, so they certainly weren't boots. Only the more younger and trendy inhabitants could recognize them as skate shoes. He too had aristocratic face, but his eyes were covered in a pair of black shades, and unlike his companion in front of him, this young man had long, messy blonde hair that spiked out in every direction. It too reached past his shoulders but were braided in three separate locks. 
Also, unlike the other man, he sported a healthy looking tan, and while both he and the corporate lookalike were quite thin, the form fitting shirt that he had on did a good job of showing off his muscles nicely. The last person had her arms wrapped around the blonde's elbow. And any straight man, young or old, immediately found themselves ogling at the beauty that had suddenly entered their district. The entrancing young girl had silky smooth pink hair that reached all the way down to her seductively round hips. It framed her beautiful face nicely and was an incredible compliment to those vibrant green eyes. She was dressed in a simple white shirt that molded her lithe body nicely like a second skin. On her neck was a black choker, her collar, with a rather large silver rosary dangling down to the top of her luscious bosom. Below, the girl wore a red miniskirt ending above mid-thigh. A pair of black stockings came after to accentuate her elegant long legs. Finally, she had on a simple pair of boots reaching up to about mid-calf, creating a teasing end to the full view of her legs. Altogether, they made for an odd and obviously foreign group to the locals. What possible reason could they have for showing up? If they were tourists, then they certainly picked an unusual stop. There was hardly any famous landmarks and even those that were had only localized appeals. What were they up to? Suddenly though, all the lights that illuminated the streets faded out. It came so suddenly that many of the vendors dropped their merchandises out of shock. It only lasted for a moment, but it was laced with a strange eeriness that had the populace shivering. It was those types of chills one would get from watching the most horrifying or brutal movies possible. The lights flashed back on quickly, returning the night streets to a visible level. But those three strangers were gone. It wasn't just a type of disappearance one could attribute to running. If that were true, then there would have been a feeling in the air, a rush of wind or something to attribute their retreat. But nothing. No slip of the wind, no rushing of feet, not even the faint sound of a breathing one could hear as people passed by them. It was as if they had vanished completely, like spirits. Quite impressive there, Kayu-kun. A fine show of your illusionary prowess. Naruto chuckled as the three of them stepped out of Stonewall. After the absent light show, Kayu had guided them to a dead-end alley, only to press his body and melt into the wall itself. It was revealed that the wall was one of many openings leading to the Kitsune village, sealed in powerful archaic spells. The blonde was impressed with the seals used to bind the room. It showed a great deal of skills and knowledge in seals array. Thank you my lord. The taller individual bowed his head in thanks. Coming from you, it is a praise above praises. HMPH. Kayu turned his head to glare at the vampire, who was meeting his angry gaze with a pair of green, slitted eyes. You're certainly one to please. Just yesterday, you were convinced that Naruto-sama was a weak human. The test of cunning that I admit to have failed. But surely one can't blame me for losing in a battle of wits against my own progenitor. Petty excuses. Naruto chuckled and held out his hands lest a fight break out between his two companions. While he would love to see who would come out stronger now that both had a good grasp of the other's skill, he was growing rather anxious to start what he came to do. We can settle this some other time, I hope. Now how much further is it to the Kitsune village? We are already in the outskirts of the village, my lord. Caillou gave Mocha one last glare, which she responded by sticking her tongue out and turned his gaze to the grassy meadow in front of them. I'd wager that we should be seeing some of the more adventurous Kaidling soon. The blonde arched an eyebrow at this. He may have completely assimilated the QB's memories, but he had never actually seen young foxes in person. His village of Kanoha, having faced the destruction caused by his past self, had made it somewhat of a vengeful sport to hunt down foxes to the brink of extinction. Because of this, the only foxes that he had ever encountered in his youth were no more than pelts displayed proudly in some sneering villager's home. It was the one of many things that had left a bitter taste in his mouth to remember such senseless slaughter to innocent beings. But of course, human vengeance and cruelty knew no limits. Once they sought to deliver their so-called justice, nothing related was spared. It was alright though. His own vengeance was just as absolute. By the end of that day of judgment, his ears were ringing with the melody of human children dying, of their mothers screaming for help, of the entire village, begging for a reprieve from the horrific extermination. Just like pain, just like the only human whom he would ever respect, he had brought complete and utter ruin to his enemies. Naruto-sama. He looked down and smiled when Mocha gently tugged on his arms, her eyes expressing a degree of worry for him. He shook his head and gave her a reassuring grin. It was warming to have someone worried about him. He certainly didn't love the vampire in the sense a human would understand. But he was definitely fond of her presence, and having her warm body pressed against him at night gave him a soothing feeling. Also, being the only female so far to not break after satisfying his lust, certainly didn't hurt either. Hyubi sama The village is just below this hill. Naruto turned his gaze over to where the four-tailed was calling from. Kaiu was standing on top of a gentle slope, pointing down to whatever it was down below. The blonde arched an eyebrow and felt a moment of excitement wash through him. 
It would be the first time he would come face to face with a whole village of individuals similar to him. He looked down to Mocha, meeting her warm green eyes from the cover of his shades. Shall we go? Mocha smiled radiantly and nodded. The two took it to a leisure pace in following Caillou, much to his displeasure. When they finally made it next to him, the four tails nodded to the large expanse below them. Welcome, he declared proudly, to the Kitsune village. It was a marvelous sight, in a pure and untainted sense. The moon high above was shining with absolute brilliance into the grassy fields below, illuminating a natural world of grassy meadows. In the very center, large mounds old enough to have grass covering their exterior, were spread about, ranging in many different sizes. Because it wasn't that late yet, there were still plenty of foxes wandering down below. Foxes large and small could be seen frolicking around the grass, playing with one another or possible looking for some snacks. To him, it was a strange sight to behold, as he had never once seen something like this. The blonde silently looked on and saw that some of the foxes began to morph as well, taking on human appearances, so that they could pick up herbs. They seemed to be doing well. Ayu scoffed at Mocha's attempted praise. Of course. Unlike you vampires, we have never entered wars where we knew victory was impossible. The young vampire glared at him, but again, Caillou paid her no mind. It wasn't until he felt a hand placed on his shoulder did he feel fear that perhaps he might have overstepped his boundaries. Yet when he turned his gaze to the great fox before him, all Naruto did was jerk his head down to the village's direction. Are we going to stand up here all night or are you going to lead me down there? Oh. Of course, please excuse me. The trio made their way down the hill and towards the village. Their trek down had immediately caught the attention of all the foxes outside, and upon recognizing one of their own, some of the kaidlings raced forward to meet him. Kaiyu-san. Look, look. It's Kaiyu-san. How are you? A, hey, you're covered in bandages. Quite the popular figure here, Kaiyu-kun. Naruto raised an eyebrow, but the four tails merely shrugged. Two kaidlings morphed into their humanoid forms and were pulling on Kaiyu's sleeves eagerly. The rest were scrutinizing his companions. Um, this one isn't a kitsune. A young fox sniffed at Mocha once before backing up and tilting his head in confusion. Smells like blood. She's a vampire. Careful or you'll get bit. The young fox turned his attention to the blonde next to Mocha, who grinned and tapped his nose in a knowing manner. The kaidling didn't know who he was as he had never seen him before, but from the scent that the person gave off, he was sure that this blonde stranger was a kitsune as well. But they were only interesting if they had anything to offer. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto. What's yours, little fox? The young kid turned looked at the hand that was offered to him, sniffing around his fingers for any sign of a threat. When he found none, the fox eagerly jumped into his palm and raced up his arm to settle onto Naruto's shoulder. There, he settled onto the blonde's shoulder and raised his head in a triumphant gesture to the other kaidlings below. He then turned his attention to the blonde and nudged his cheek with the top of his head. I'll tell you if you have a treat for me. Naruto chuckled and reached into his pocket. The young kid watched with interest as he fished around until finally pulling something out. At the sight of what was in his hand, the little fox flattened his ears in disappointment. It was an ornate-looking arm guard small enough to fit on his front leg. He had been hoping for some meat. Sorry but you can't expect me to have meat right away would you? Naruto grinned and reached up to tie the guard around the fox's front left leg. Besides, meat is something that disappears when you eat it. This will stay as long as you don't lose it. He pawed at the guard, feeling a bit strange and having an object hanging off of his leg. But the gesture was not lost to him, and he knew to at least show some gratitude. The elder fox named me Jinkuro. He finally answered. And everyone else calls me it so that's what I go by. What about your parents? They're dead. Naruto scat and was about to apologize when Jinkuro straightened up and puffed out his chest in pride. I never knew my parents, but everyone in the village talked highly of them. My father, Kurumeru, was a powerful kitsune warrior who sacrificed himself in battle to ensure our village's survival. My mother, Tsukiko, was given a fatal wound from that same battle, but survived long enough to give birth to me. I am proud to be their son. Obviously, the feelings one would associate with Lost was different between monsters and humans. Naruto shook his head but decided to not pursue the subject. He glanced over to Mocha, who was kneeling down and playing with the rest of the kaidlings. The vampire met his gaze and stood up as well, but not before allowing the young foxes to hitch a ride. Do also climbed up to settle on either side of her shoulders, while the last one was picked up and hugged underneath her bosom. Seeing their relaxed expressions along with Mocha's fondness for all things fluffy amused the blonde, and he chuckled at the sight. Well then, Jinkuro-kun, perhaps you can help us. Kaiyu-san seems to be a bit preoccupied, so I think we'll have to rely on you for the time being. Sure. The small fox lazily adjusted himself to a more comfortable position. What do you need? I'm looking for the elder fox that you were talking about. There are a few things that I need to ask. 
Ng Kuro immediately raised his long tail to point up ahead. Akaham Sama lives in the largest of the homes. She's usually inside or near so that shouldn't be any trouble. You have my thanks. Naruto scratched the young fox's head gently, earning a sound of contentment from Jinkuro, and began his trek towards the elder fox's home. Mocha was about to follow her lover when the blonde turned and grinned in her direction. Why don't you go and have some fun with the foxes? The conversation shouldn't be too long, and I'll join you after it's all done. Are you sure? Naruto nodded. Mocha looked like she didn't quite believe him, and her body language clearly said that she wanted to follow him. But the young vampire eventually relented, and with a heartfelt glance to his direction, she headed off to a different direction at the urging of the three kidlings. The blonde followed her form for a bit, simply drinking in the sight of his lover's perfect form, before reluctantly returning to the path set before him. By the way, who is that vampire anyways? I just noticed it now, but she had some of your scent all over her and vice versa. Mocha's my lover. Naruto shrugged as they continued making their way to the largest mound. I guess you can say she's my mate. Does that mean you're going to do the ritual to her? What do you think? As the two chatted, Naruto noticed that just about everyone in the open had their eyes on him. The blonde could hear the whispers going about as the older, more experienced foxes noticed the immense power pulsing from just beneath the surface. At the same time, his scent as a fellow kitsune was easily noticed, and many were wondering as to just who he was. The blonde paid them little attention for the moment. There would be plenty of time for him to immerse himself into the kitsune culture. But at the moment, he had more pressing matters to attend to. The largest of the grass mounds finally came to view, and once he neared the entrance, Jinkuro jumped off of his shoulder. The small fox landed lightly on his feet and ran in, with a blonde casually following from behind. Akaham sama This foreign kitsune wanted to meet you. He says his name is Yuzumaki Naruto. Do you know him? The moment Naruto saw the supposed leader of the fox, he came to the conclusion that elder fox was an incredibly misleading term. Akaham, in her human hybrid form, was one of the most beautiful individuals that his eyes had ever seen. She looked to be in physical youth, with a body that looked no older than early to mid-twenties. Her face, while youthful in its beauty, held a mature air, a refinement of someone with great wisdom. Her hair, a rich auburn in shade, flowed down the back of her head like a blanket, disturbed only by the seven foxtails behind her, and the two foxtails above of equal coloring. Akaham was dressed in a relatively conservative-looking yukata, but the front of her robes were loose and just enough for him to see an impressive cleavage. Naruto could say without a doubt that Akaham was one of the most beautiful individuals that he had ever seen. But he was more interested in her reaction to his presence. The moment he had walked in, he saw that the wise Kitsune knew something was strange. Her posture, though hard to see to any normal individual, belied naked fear to his experienced eyes. She was scared of his presence, and that was enough for him to know she possessed knowledge of his being. Surprisingly, Akaham reeled in that fear and plastered a warm, motherly smile to the little kidling that had announced his arrival. Thank you Jinkuro. Now, please go out and play with the other children while I entertain our guest. Jinkuro gave an excited yip and bounded out of the mound eagerly. The moment his form left the home, Naruto felt the telltale signs of containment seals activating. Again, it was an impressive show of seal works, and he would have loved to study them more, but his attention was focused to the kitsune leader, who had now stood up to face him. Akaham parted the lower half of her yukata to reveal a pair of long, smooth legs. While Naruto would have loved to simply stare at them, the blonde knew that she was actually setting herself for better mobility. The proof was in how her golden slits for eyes began to glow with power, and the seals becoming visible to hide her energies from the outside. Well I'd say that you're certainly hostile. The kitsune narrowed her eyes and replied in a cool voice. Your presence as a kitsune may have fooled the rest of the villagers, but my eyes can see what others cannot. You have the shadow of a crimson fox, bathed in blood and whirling with nine burning tails. Indeed. Naruto smirked condescendingly. Seems your sight is pretty accurate then. Who are you? You have the presence of a fox and a power greater than what I have ever felt before. You bear the look of a young man, yet the rage in your power has seen thousands of years. Akaham brandished her tails, which had sharpened to deadly points. You are not of this world. Why have you come here? What is it that you seek? Naruto remained silent. He gave no indication of having even acknowledged her accusations. But the elder fox was no foolish. She knew that he was much stronger than her, and that any attack must be given with the utmost care. So she watched as the blonde surveyed her home, surveying the numerous seals that now pulsed with the energy she reflexively provided. He seemed to have been contemplating something, perhaps wondering if he should take her threat seriously. Finally, the blonde finally met her gaze and smiled. The curve of his lips was an immediately warning, but before she could do anything, the room became engulfed with raw, burning rage. Akaham's eyes widened in surprise at the sight, and her body collapsed back to the ground. 
In an instant, Naruto had flared out of his human form and took on the same hybrid look as herself, releasing so much demonic energy that it wrapped around her body like magma. All around, the glowing symbols that made up her containment seal flared with more light than she had ever seen before in trying to suppress the sheer weight of this stranger's yaki. She didn't even know if the seals were completely successful. Just the sight of them working so hard was enough to confirm what her body already knew. You know, I'm grateful that you made this containment field as strong as it is. Naruto smiled and looked down on her, his blonde hair now blood red and his eyes now glowing with a violet flame. Because I can show you this form without fear of the entire world finding out. The demon fox chuckled and took his seat across from her, using his tails as a chair. Now, I will answer all of your questions truthfully, but in return, I expect you to do the same. Are we clear? Despite the benevolence coming from his smile and the lightness of his tone, Akiham truly felt pressured from all sides, if only because the aura surrounding him screamed for blood. Still, she tried her best to regain her composure and at his request, nodded in confirmation. That was all Naruto needed. Good, good. Now, where should I begin? Mocha smiled at the antics of the three small foxes. The four of them had gone off a bit away from the main village and near a large pond. There, the kidlings had immediately jumped off of her and began pouncing on one another. She would have been content simply to watch them have their fun, but the three also jumped on her as well. The young vampire had been caught by surprise and fell to the thick grass below. It was all in good fun and she laughed as well. Now, the small foxes were allowing her some time to rest while they went and continued their mock battle. The vampire girl laid her body against a nearby tree and sighed, feeling her body relax. It was peaceful here, with the natural beauty untainted by human pollution. There was just something in the very air that soothed her being and made her want to just spend the day relaxing. Was this how everyone felt when they entered? Before she could mull over that thought, an unexpected weight suddenly plopped itself onto her thigh. She opened her eyes and saw one of the small foxes lounging on her thigh. Despite how cute and cuddly they looked to her, she had to frown at the action and reached out to pluck the child from her lap. No claws. She admonished. I don't want my stockings to tear. The small fox growled and struggled, much to her amusement. Her body was so small that even though she tried swiping at Mocha with her claws, it didn't even reach her wrist. Finally, the child gave and simply slumped seemingly in exhaustion. Mocha, satisfied with this, gently laid her onto the grass besides her. Only for the kidling to swipe at her with a tail. Mocha looked on in amusement as the fox scampered out of her sight. A trickster in blood and history. She shouldn't have expected her to accept admonishment so gracefully. Nana, Vampire Neeson. She looked down to see the same fox that ran away now sitting next to her with its playmates next to her. The young vampire arched an eyebrow and made a gesture for them to continue. Are you Kaiusen's mate? The fox tilted her head in confusion. Because Kaiusen's and strong Yanbi Kitsune and you two look like you'd be great together. Mocha stared at the fox. She kept staring. And staring. Finally, she gently held out a large rock in her palm for the foxes. The three looked at it quizzically, wondering just what was it that she wanted them to see. It was just a plain old water rock with a smooth flat surface. Nothing special about that. The answer came when suddenly, that rock was crushed in an instant. All three of the kidlings stared as the vampire opened up her hand again and shook it to dust off the small rock bits. She smiled brightly and gently tapped the terrified Kitsune in the nose. You're a cute child. She answered sweetly. But if you mistake me for Kaiyu's mate again, I'll crush that head just like I did to this rock. Understand. The foxes nodded, scared senseless by the strength displayed. But Mocha wasn't satisfied with it and continued on. For your information, the blonde that I came with is my lover. He's much stronger than Kaiyu will ever be. You mean Naruto? All eyes turned to the new arrival, and Mocha immediately recognized the fox from the arm guard given to it. Oh, Jinkuro-kun. Did you take Naruto to where he needed? The small fox scratched his ear with his back leg and nodded. Yep. Akihama-sama seemed to have wanted to speak to Naruto about something, so she told me to go play. I knew you guys would be here. Well, it's the best place to get some snacks. You're a glutton. You know you love me. Like a sore on my front paw. The two foxes and Mocha in the sidelines quietly watched the verbal spar between Jinkuro and the kit that had asked her such a daring question. They looked like they were having fun when Jinkuro suddenly growled and pounced on top of the other. It's a lover's quarrel. One of the foxes commented. Trust Yume to annoy Jinkuro like that. The brief fight ended with a slightly larger Jinkuro holding up Yume's tail in his mouth triumphantly. Mocha applauded him for the show and he spat the tail out, much to his opponent's displeasure. So you're that Naruto's mate huh? When are you going to enter the ritual? All attention was now focused onto her again, and Mocha honestly didn't know what to say. She had no idea what this ritual was. But it seemed obvious that it had something to do with one's mate. 
Did it mean a wedding? Yum seemed to have picked up on her confusion and readily supplied an answer. The ritual is a strong seal that is used for kitsune mates from other species, turning them into fellow kitsunes. My mother was a water nymph, and she came out of the ritual as a kitsune. Also, I hear that you keep some of your old powers as well, so it's an amazing piece of work. Mocha mulled the thought over. From what she could gather, the ritual would transform her into a pseudo kitsune. That would explain how the small kaitling seemed so open to the idea of a mate from another species. What better way to stop hybrid offsprings than by converting those mates into fellow kitsune? It was practical and yet genius at the same time. The young vampire had to wonder why the other monster species did not follow in the same footsteps. If Naruto-sama wishes it then I will accept. She replied easily. I don't really have any misgivings with being converted into a fellow fox. Naruto-sama. Is he some powerful fox demon? The young vampire smiled and winked. Something like that. Akahem stared at the being in front of her. The story spoken by this stranger seemed almost impossible to believe. But the matriarch of the Kitsune village had been alive for nearly a thousand years. She would have easily been able to detect a lie. Everything that came out of Yuzumaki Naruto's mouth had been nothing but the truth. Even if she did not want to believe, the sheer presence of this being would have left her no choice. It explained everything about his appearance. The reason why he was nothing like QB sama was because he really wasn't. Yuzumaki Naruto was a denizen from another world, a world dominated by humans wielding elemental techniques strong enough to tear through countries. In a world like that, where the average soldier could kill many through spells, it would not be unbelievable if the demons were far stronger as well. The elder fox eyed and idly rubbed her head. Across from her, Yuzumaki Naruto, still in his hybrid form, looked at her plight with amusement in his eyes. The brat found her predicament funny. If he wasn't league stronger than herself, she would have struck him for his cheek. I believe you. She dropped her hand and went back to her formal sitting position. As per our agreement, I will answer any and all questions you might have concerning this world. Good. Then we can begin immediately. Naruto crossed his legs and settled into a neutral expression. First, you can explain to me as to why the monster races are hiding in shadow realms. Assuming that you all have been alive when humanity was still in its primitive stages, lording over them should not have been trouble. He was sharp. The young fox knew that something was strange with their current lives. Of course, she shouldn't have expected anything else. He had told her that from the first day of his arrival, he had immersed himself in gathering information. It would have struck him as strange immediately if the school he entered turned out to have been made for coexistence rather than pure domination. The golden age of us monsters was rooted in ancient times. You can still read about those mythical tales of beasts strong enough to devour nations and challenge gods. Those were the times when we lorded over the humans and treated them as nothing more than toys and food. Akaham folded her hands on top of her lap and bowed her head sadly. But they soon disappeared when humans began to discover strange abilities. Magicians began to appear nearly 2000 years ago and with them came the strength to combat us. Because our ancestors did not originally see them as a threat, we allowed them to populate numerous areas and grow in numbers. With the growth of humans came a growth of magicians as well. They became overwhelmed by numbers alone and were beat back into the shadows. And it was like this ever since. No. We monsters of the East experienced a renewal and strength over a thousand years ago. That was the time when QB Sama appeared to us. Its power was like a beacon, and we grew in strength to rise once more. Under QB Sama's guidance, we fraught with the humans and very nearly won against them. But that was until the foreigners came. Naruto arched an eyebrow, but she did not allow him time to retort. Eastern magicians focused on the abilities to curse and summon servants. Because fighting them became more conventional, we easily defeated most of their diviners and summons. But when the foreigners came and began spreading the ideas of those western spells, we too were beat back, and QB Sama was sealed. Without that beacon to give us strength, we fell back into the shadows. It has been that way ever since. The young fox mulled over her words. And what of those magicians? They have since consolidated power with their patron god. To this day, they still seek for any chance to wipe us out completely. The patron god. The so-called holy god of Christianity. Naruto's eyes widened in surprise. He had not been expecting one of the world's most influential religion to have magicians in their employment. He thought the religion abhorred any type of witchcraft unless. Exorcists. Naruto narrowed his eyes as he dug up some obscure information gleamed weeks ago. A secret order that has its own hierarchy. The elder Kitsune nodded. Indeed. And their presence on this island have been gaining in strength and popularity over the years. Pretty soon, we will be driven to a corner. You don't have to tell me that. He knew full well just how popular it was getting. Hell, some of those damn manga books left in the dorms had been considerably influenced by the Christian religion. Even the headmaster was. The headmaster. Akahem-san. 
What can you tell me about the headmaster of Yakai Academy? I clearly felt the Yaki of a monster from him, but he was dressed in the garbs of a priest. At the mention of the headmaster, Akahim snarled and flared her demonic energy. That fool is nothing but a traitor. She spat in disgust. A pathetic mongrel who sold himself to the exorcists in exchange for a position of power. To think that he was once one of the respected Dark Lords. Now he is nothing but an agent of that order, with the sole purpose of weakening monsters and aiding them to live peacefully with humans. Why isn't this common knowledge? There were few of us that knew of his betrayal from the beginning. And after, the order sent their hunters to kill those that found out. Only a handful including myself remain. But I have passed down this knowledge to the village, and ever since, we have been hiding carefully from the exorcists. And Caillou's position in school. The position of trust meant to gather information. Only fools who hide in ignorance would not attempt to exploit hidden traitors. Naruto was impressed with their skills regarding information. The kids soon seemed well immersed in the field of intelligence. They would make for the perfect spies and scouts. And judging from the brief display of power from their matriarch, he could see that they were quite strong in combat as well. Good. He'll be needing their abilities in the future. Do more questions and we'll call it a day, Akahim san Naruto grinned and tapped his forehead. You wouldn't happen to know where your QB is sealed, would you? Of course. We all know where QB Sama sleeps, but we simply lack the strength to both combat the exorcists and destroy the barriers. Her eyes suddenly widened and her body bolted upright. Don't tell me you mean to. Naruto's grin only widened. The location, if you please. She slumped back to her seat, struck dumb with his unconfirmed intent. Only when he began waving his hand in front of her did she remember his earlier question. He is Achi, or what is now known as Hikado. There is a small kitsune shrine near the Asashikawa prefecture. It is housed in a large cave by the mountains and heavily guarded by the exorcist stationed there. Now see? That wasn't so hard. Naruto chuckled and stood up. In an instant, his body morphed back into his human form, displaying a fluid control of his incredible powers. The now blonde demon returned his gaze to her and lightly scratched his head in an almost sheepish manner. And that last question. What the hell did Jinkuro mean by a ritual anyways? Hours later, Naruto was resting in a luxurious bed, within a suite from one of Kyoto's most expensive hotels. While his body relaxed, his mind was working through the information that the Kitsune matriarch had provided for him. It would seem that the exorcists and their holy spells would prove to be an annoyance. It didn't take much to figure that whatever powered their spells would be the exact opposite of Yaoki. His lover's own rosary should be proof of that. Still, it shouldn't be too difficult to pursue his goals here. All he needed was time and that was something he had in abundance. Patience is a virtue he knew all too well but of course, all of it would be for naught if he cannot free this world's QB. Is something on your mind, Naruto-sama? The blonde turned his gaze to see his lover, fresh out of the relaxing bath and clad only in the complimentary yukata. She smiled at him and climbed into bed as well, making a deliberate show of her swaying hips. Naruto watched her silently as she climbed the bed and mounted herself on top of him. Her legs were parted, allowing her to gently grind against him, earning an appreciative groan from him. I'm just going over some plans. Naruto reached up to her sash and easily loosened it, allowing the fabric of her robes to slide down her body. Mocha didn't see the need to part with the clothes completely and merely shrugged off the sleeves as she continued the slow, arousing dance on top of him. How do you feel about going to Hikado? Mocha leaned down and laid herself fully on top of him. She pressed her head to the side of his neck and bit with a bit more force than usual, earning her a chuckle from him. Guess you don't like it. Of course not. She replied lightly. What sane person would love the cold? Especially when it's winter time. If all goes well, we shouldn't be there for more than three days. What is it that you're planning? Mocha blinked when she felt him tap the back of her head. She pulled herself back and grimaced when she saw him grinning cheekily. Patience. You'll know everything soon enough. That would be the most she could get out of him, as unsatisfactory as it might be. Nevertheless, she accepted it and returned to feeding. Mocha shivered in ecstasy as the warm ambrosia drained into her mouth. She could never get enough of the taste, texture, and quality of her lover's blood. That with the flood of power into her body only made it that much more enticing. It was so good that she couldn't help but moan in pleasure as she sucked on his blood, and even when she was finished, her tongue would slide over his puncture mark slowly to savor the flavor. Naruto laughed and caressed the back of her head when she was done. Is my blood really that amazing? You sounded like you were already having sex with me. Mocha lifted her head and indeed, the drowsy, satisfied expression on her face was as if she had just made love to him. The young vampire smiled and leaned forward to kiss him, gently parting his mouth to slide her tongue in. They played like that for a while, simply allowing their tongues to lick and fondle one another. Then, she unexpectedly ended the kiss and pulled back. 
Naruto raised an eyebrow at the sudden end, but refrained from saying anything when she decided to press a finger to his mouth. Naruto saw Momoka said his name quietly and with more humbleness than usual. I have a request to make of you. Oh? She hardly ever request anything from him specifically. What is it? I, I want to take the ritual. Mocha licked her lips, building up the courage for herself. I want to be a kitsune, just like you. The blonde sighed, having expected something like this. The kitsune matriarch had given him a general idea as to what the ritual was about, but truthfully, he didn't really care either way. But he knew that Mocha would definitely see this as an opportunity for herself. He and gave her an exasperated look and said clearly. You know that I don't care if you're still a vampire. It's not like it'll make that much of a difference if you take it or not. It might not make much of a difference to you, but it does to me. I, I want to stay as your loyal mate. There's nothing that can show my devotion more than that. Mocha gave him a pleading expression. Please accept this. I want to stay with you and remain at your side forever. Naruto searched her expression silently, quietly seeing if she was truly earnest in this request. All he saw was pure devotion to himself and a desire to have her way. That it him amused and since there really weren't any drawbacks to the ritual itself, he had no opinion in the matter. The blonde sighed again and reached up to tap her head. Idiot. He replied lightly. If you're that intent on doing this, who am I to stop you? Mocha's eyes lit up in happiness, and she embraced him joyfully. To her, his permission was the single greatest moment of her life. It wasn't just about the ritual that had worried her. She took a huge gamble on her part when she proclaimed herself as his mate. She knew all too well that a being as powerful as Naruto could have easily denied her as his mate and saw her more as a warm bed to satisfy his lust. She was somewhat expecting that as well, and to hear him admitting her as his mate in his own way was just like dream. But. She yelped in surprise when he unexpectedly thrusted his hips upward. The mission and the little history lesson comes first. Naruto-sama thank you. The blonde waved her thanks aside, preferring to indulge himself in the finer aspects of mating. Pretty soon, the only things going through the vampire's mind were pleasure and fatigue, as he saw fit to sate his desires on her body. Yet even through the roughness of sex, one thing nagged at Naruto. The headmaster of the school was a yaokai, and yet he took on the robes of an exorcist. While he knew nothing of their structured hierarchy, the blonde had a feeling that the headmaster was perhaps at the very bottom in terms of command. That meant that there were potentially numerous other exorcists stronger than the Dark Lords. And if they had the strength to even seal away a QB, even one far weaker than himself, then perhaps they would prove to be the challenge his darker self desired. Just the thought of a worthy battle had him filled with anticipation. How big of a fish lurked in those waters? How tempting of a bait will he need to lure them in? And how big of a knife will he need to gut them? So this part ends here. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, so quickly like this video for second part of this series. And comment down below your thoughts about this series. And now it's time for me to go, bye.